Welcome back to the Web EV Talk series. Today is the 7th September 2021. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome Tasmas, Thomas Korkmaras from Elham Institute and the Quadram Institute in Norwich, UK. So Thomas is a tenure track group leader working with both experimental and computational approaches to study cell cell and cell microbe interactions in the gut. He is a system biologist with particular interest to study signaling networks, host microbe interactions, autophagy, and using intestinal organoids and multi-omics methods. His group aims to understand biological system related to gut homeostasis and to facilitate precision medicine and personalized microbial therapies in the field of inflammatory bowel disease. So today his lecture is on cell type specific analysis of interkingdom connections between EVs from bacteroids, tetai, tau, micron, <laughs> and cells from healthy and IVD patients. So before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Horiba Scientific, who is uh, generously sponsored this session. And um, Please uh, go to patreon.com uh, and so, uh, find web TV talk if you like to sponsor us or direct message us directly. Okay. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon for someone. Uh, just checking, is everything okay with the sharing and the sound? All good. Okay, excellent. So it's my great pleasure uh, to, to present our work uh, on bacteria the micron. And that was the last time I mentioned this mouthful name. It will be called BT for the rest of the talk. And, and basically on a cell type specific analysis that, that we did. So um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm working in the UK and in East Anglia in Norwich uh, in two very nice institutes. Uh, one is the Erlem Institute, which is a more computational omics generating systems biology institute. And next door, uh, there's the Quadram Institute. The building was just opened uh, before COVID. And it's a really nice uh, new institute where we are studying uh, gut health uh, with a really large endoscopy unit, uh, belong to the hospital, nearby hospital, and then our labs uh, above that. So it's a really nice multidisciplinary place to, to study host microbe interactions. And uh, the key, key, key aim for my group is to, to study cell cell and cell microbe interactions. I'm particularly interested about gut homeostasis uh, precision medicine and how we can use microbial therapies in inflammatory bowel disease, a disease type I'm going to introduce. And this is, this is my group. Uh, they are really a nice set of people with, with different backgrounds and, and, and expertise. Um, our group is, is, as I mentioned, interested about gut health and we generate lots of omics data or we use uh, publicly available uh, data and our forte is basically on, on this side, on the blue side of the uh, of the circle, how we can integrate and 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 use and interpret uh, this data, and then doing in vitro validations or going back to, to some clinical studies um, to to validate uh, or or translate our results. And and the group is particularly interested about signaling networks, uh, be it host microbe interactions or patient specific ones. Um, and um, the other things were, were mentioned um, in the introduction. So today, uh, the talk will have uh, two introductory parts. First, I'm going to highlight some challenges that uh, as a former experimental biologist, currently systems biologist, I see as challenges. Uh, mention some opportunities that um, tools that we have developed to tackle these challenges and might be relevant for some of your projects. Um, then I will highlight one specific one, which is about how to, to look at host microbe interactions. Um, and the second part of the talk, or most of the time, I'm going to talk about uh, the specific case study where we apply these approaches to study how uh, EVs from BT um, can, can have a cell type and condition specific effect. So let's start with, with these key challenges. And, and the key topic and then the key theme basically over uh, during the whole talk will be related to this uh, specificity question. And there, are, when we, when you say specificity, uh, what what you, what 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 I mean is that that 
often it matters which part of the cell there's an interaction. Is it a mitochondria, nucleus, cytoplasmic, membrane-related interaction? Which cell types have interactions? If you are looking at microbes, often different strains can be different. So at these tissues, diseases, patients. So on the, on the, on the upper right, uh, right corner, you can see a very nice uh, figure from a colleague of mine uh, about the importance of why single cell transcriptome analysis is important. So if you have, let's say, six different cells and each expresses different genes that you see with the different um, circles, then, then you get uh, such co-expression uh, matrix, basically knowing that it's, uh, it's usually uh, blue and red that are uh, co-expressing and, and blue and uh, red are not co-expressed. But if you do a normal bulk RNA-seq analysis, which is more common, obviously, uh, because of cost and availability, uh, then you lose this signal. And then you don't see the cell type specific effects. And that could be often very important because even for a specific cell marker, if we, if we sort them, for example, we can still end up with different subpopulations, but you don't get it in an RNA-seq analysis. Um, this is a well-known figure used in many talks, but I, I like to, to, to highlight the importance of specificity also from the precision medicine point of view. There are different uh, drugs or treatment that could be useful for a specific set of patients where it can be inefficient or actually uh, toxic for another set of patients. So, so these are also important things to, to, to understand, um, let's say, the conditions a given host is in. And all these are very important for personalized microbial therapy, where we would like to understand which microbial treatment could be useful for which set of patients, which cohorts. And, and I think in the next, next couple of years, decade, this will be a very interesting and, and, and um, exciting opportunity in, in, in medicine. But the key message from all this is basically that if you just randomly investigate the cell or a patient population, we can easily miss a signal. Uh, because we average the values with bulk RNA sequencing, for example. The other issue is that, that I often see is that we combine lots of data, but we are basically just aggregating it uh, just to have a bigger data set, bigger cohort or, or, or more, more coverage. But if we do it without, without filtering or without proper uh, approaches, we can create very artificial data sets which can contain false positives. So the last introductory slide from, 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 from this section is basically about the, the key, key question in biology is often to connecting the genotype with the phenotype. And, and for that, we often generate different omics data sets, um, proteomics, transcriptomics data sets. We would like to combine them, do different statistical analysis or machine learning uh, recently more and more, um, basically to, to, to have a better understanding what is in a specific system, biological system. And when we, are, we, when we were able to integrate these omics data sets, we would like to interpret them. And often uh, networks or, or pathway diagrams are used uh, to connect a priori biological knowledge with the omics uh, information. And ideally all these will, will improve uh, prediction of health and diseases. But to achieve this, we need multiple things. And I just listed here a few. First of all, we need scalable and reusable pipelines. Pipelines that, that experimental people can, can use easily. You, don't, you wouldn't need programming knowledge uh, uh, for that. It can help, but you don't, wouldn't need it. That are able to integrate multi-omics data and, and look cell type specific signaling pathways. So we can understand better what is happening in a specific cell type. In an ideal world, we could in, include genotype variation of different patients into these models. And uh, as going out from just looking at host human uh, cells, understanding better what is in the microbiome, be it in the gut or in other parts of the body. And, and there's a bioinformatics computational uh, story behind all this, that how you can store and query it um, in, a, in a very efficient way. And, and in this slide, I just summarized some of the tools we have developed because it might be useful for, for your project. The, the first one is not particularly, I guess, that that's basically a really modern uh, big data storage system that we just published called Sherlock. But uh, our network resources could be particularly rele relevant for your studies. 
So 15 years ago, uh, we developed Signaling, which is a signaling pathway uh, resource, uh, contains lots of relevant uh, pathways in a, in a very, very good uh, detailed level of re relevant in, in cancer or, or development and, and other uh, immune uh, functions. And we have two uh, specific uh, resources. One is focusing on autophagy, a uh, very key cellular process, and the other is uh, nerve two and oxidative stress related responses. So, so if you are working around these these topics, these network resources could be really helpful for for you. But there are many other resources, um, dozens of them, and uh, we created a project with a colleague of mine, Julio Sáez Rodriguez, um, called Omnipass, where we basically realized that people often struggle how to access this pathway data and what, what they can do with, uh, how, how can they select which, which resource is good for their project and how they can access it. So we created Omnipass, making it all, all easier uh, for everybody. Basically it's a one-stop shop uh, for, for all these kind of uh, data types. It contains more than 50 different pathway resources in a, in a curated, uh, so curated data, and integrated in a, in a way that, that we made sure that that, uh, that the information is, is, is correct, that we added there and we added different annotations of the, of the um, proteins um, there, including the regulation, cell-cell interactions, uh, protein complex informations, drug interactions. So lots of things that, that, that normally can take often six to 12 months for a bioinformatics postdoc to, to really evaluate and, and give it give to you or to use your, your omics analysis. And here you can easily use this data. And we have lots of tutorials uh, to help you work with that. It's available in multiple languages, uh, R and Python, but also in Cytoscape, which is a, a, a graphical interface. So it's a really nice tool to, to look at this type of data without any programming and it's right to visualizes everything. So after you have, and we have these network resources, we want different pipelines to, to analyze re, uh, multiple times data sets and visualize them. One of the pipelines that we are working on is called ISNIP, which is a precision medicine uh, tool. I will not have time to talk about it today, but it's quite relevant to distinguish networks and different patients. Uh, SCOmics, which is a really cool platform to, to work with single cell uh, data. I'm not going to uh, highlight it further, but the, the analysis I, I'm going to show was, was, was actually run on this. And Microbiomics, which is basically a host microbe interaction platform, and I'm going to talk more about, about that. So, so the key topic I, I would like to highlight today is how, how we can connect microbes or microbial molecules and, and host cells. And this microbiomics uh, platform is, has two, two parts. One is still uh, under development. I have a final year PhD since it's just finishing it, which is a really nice machine learning based approach to look at microbiome data, multiple readouts from the microbiome and through supervised and unsupervised uh, approaches, identify features. It could be microbial sequences, molecules, strains that are somehow different between two conditions, let's say a healthy and, and uh, uh, diseased phenotype. And the other part is the microbiolink pipeline, which we, which we published last year, um, where basically we are taking proteins from the microbiome. In, in this particle, first publication is a metaproteomics data set. And we take proteins from the host cell, and then we try to connect them, I'm going to mention how, and then look at that after this binding, what kind of signaling chains are, 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 are happening in a host cell. In the, this use case, we were looking at autophagy regulation. And if you are interested about different approaches available, uh, we recently published this, this review in Frontiers in Microbiology. So, so you, you can see other, other really good approaches there. So looking at this microbiome pipeline on the right side. So, so the idea is that, that we take microbial molecules, which, which could be uh, coming from uh, bacterial extracellular vesicles, can, can be surface proteins, um, can be metabolites. And we are interested how they can affect human cells 
for that we take human uh, molecules from human cells. And we try to uh, identify first protein-protein interactions. We are, we are working on metabolite interactions as well, but I would like to focus on protein-protein interactions today. So microbial protein, host protein interactions. And then after establishing which proteins can interact, we are interested in what is happening downstream, what kind of signaling pathways are getting transduced, and then measure the differentially expressed genes uh, on a host cell. So this is a more detailed view of this microbiome pipeline, but, but in the second part of the, uh, at the uh, case study, I'm going to, to mention each box in more detail. Uh, basically, the idea is that, that we take multiple resources to, 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 to predict the protein-protein interactions. Uh, we have multiple quality control steps to, to, to basically decrease the, the number of potential interactions to the most reliable ones, um, and, and then integrate the different a priori information and signaling pathways to, to really look at those specific uh, reactions that, that we feel that are affected uh, by, by this in, in interaction. And what is really important here, and in a way the, the key thing I would like to highlight uh, in our work, is the importance of what kind of host transcriptomic data you are using for that. As I mentioned, you can use bulk RNA-seq data, and in many projects we have done it before, and then you have a, a healthy tissue specific network and then you have a disease tissue specific network and you can identify differentially expressed genes uh, and then you can say that okay so these genes have some kind of differential expression so probably they are important in the disease looking at the functions of these uh, DAGs often actually you can you can interpret and identify which functions are relevant uh, the technological advancement now allowed us, on the other hand, to look at single cell level and cell type specific analysis, where for each cell type, um, you can have different set of genes. And it means that, that you can generate cell type specific networks instead of a tissue level one, uh, which means obviously more data, more differentially expressed genes, but uh, a better granularity to, to look at what is happening and what is changing. And, and I think this is really important when we are looking at host microbe interactions and we would like to understand what these extra vesicle, extracellular vesicles produced by different gut bacteria uh, are doing with us because they are, and that's the key message of this talk, they are doing different things to different cell types. And while it's not surprising to hear that, I guess, um, in most of the published studies um, because of technological limitations or, or computational biology limitations, these, these things were, were ignored. So, so I think it's, it's really important to, to consider that, that these, these interactions can have different cell type specific effects. And as I will point out, also they can have different effects uh, depending on the condition uh, of, the, of the host. So, um, our main focus here is, is bacterial destatotiotine micron, uh, which is a gram-negative anaerobe. And it's a really dominant commensal bacteria in the human gut. And it produces uh, different uh, BAVs, bacteria extracellular vesicles, um, which are really important in interkingdom communication. Multiple, multiple papers uh, show this earlier. Um, and they, they also known to regulate immune homeostasis. And that makes it really interesting uh, for, for our studies. Also, it's known that, that, that it can have basically an anti-inflammatory response by affecting different immune cell types, T-Rex, TH2 cells, uh, TH1, TH17 cells, uh, and, and producing IL-10 and other anti-inflammatory uh, molecules. However, what is not that known is basically what is the molecular basis for these effects and what the cell type specific law, role in inflammation for, for these BABs. Um, and the disease I'm particularly interested in and, and combine this, this, this uh, and integrate it to this project is inflammatory bowel disease, which is a kind of a really complex disease. There is some kind of genetic background for that. Uh, dysregulation of the immune system and then some changes in the intestinal microbiome. For example, there is much less BT um, in, in, in the gut of, of these patients, but we don't really know what is actually happening there. We just, we just realize it eventually. Two major types of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, 
Uh, today, I'm going to focus more on ulcerative colitis, which is a, a, an IBD type, which is relevant in the rectum and in the colon. Um, and there is a, an issue that currently the treatments are really ineffective uh, for, for these uh, patients, unfortunately, and, and uh, the, the prevalence of, of the disease is, is, is worryingly increasing um, in the world. Uh, now appearing in, in, in countries where, where 10, 15 years ago, there was no, uh, no real uh, prevalence of, of the disease. And uh, because of all the, the symptoms, basically it affects uh, not only the actual patients, but their families. They are not, 20 percent of the patients are not able to work uh, properly. So the course of the disease is basically that, that eventually after some triggering events, which we don't really know, um, there is some kind of um, flare in the gut. And, and then after giving some treatments, there's an induction or remission of the disease. And in most of the cases, unfortunately, the disease comes back. And that, that, that's why treatments are ineffective. My, my group's key aim is to keep the patients on, on, on this remission uh, part. And, and we feel that BT and bacterial therapy could be a key uh, to achieve that. The uh, gut looks like this uh, in a healthy colon or in an inflamed colon. So, so there are different cell types that is really important to understand. Um, when you have an inflammation, you have different inflammatory cells coming closer to the epithelial layer. Often there are leaks, meaning that the bacterial content of the lumen can easily access uh, different resident immune cells easier than in a healthy situation because you have less mucus. And uh, so there are different cell populations. That, that, that's an important thing. And um, because of all these things I mentioned before, uh, BT have been already studied in uh, preclinical mouse models of uh, IBD. And, and it was found that actually um, it can suppress inflammation. So it, it seemed that it could be a really interesting approach uh, to, 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 to develop bacterial therapy or microbial therapy uh, for IBD patients. But as I mentioned, we don't really know why they are working and how they are working. So we defined this project uh, to develop a, a pipeline, most importantly, to look at inter and intracellular interactions between uh, BAF proteins produced by BT and host proteins. And we selected a few immune cell types that, that, that we were interested um, and uh, to, to look at that. And uh, for this particular project, we just generated, uh, actually for a previous project, we generated with a collaborator, uh, BEF proteomics data uh, in Simon Carding's group. Um, and from the public domain, we got single cell transitomy data. In an ideal world, we would do everything in our lab and we have some ongoing experiments where we are, have such own multi-omics data sets. But actually to develop a pipeline, existing omics data sets already peer reviewed and, and, and uh, assessed by multiple colleagues are actually often better. And when we have this, we want to compare uh, the set of specific differences between healthy and disease condition, in our case, UC. So for all these cell types, we had um, from healthy patients and also from, from inflamed conditions. So as I mentioned, we had this proteomics data set. Uh, we had the single cell uh, data set I mentioned, and then we used different omics, uh, sorry, different network data sets and pathway data sets to, to look at um, the a priori information I'm going to show to you. So the workflow, how, how we did this project was that we took this published single cell data uh, of different, um, different cell types from, from healthy and UC patients. We selected like dendritic cells and monocytes and macrophages. Um, and then using this omnipass resource I mentioned, we created cell type specific networks in the cytoscape tool. Um, and, and we specifically looked at the toll-like receptor. And I'm going to, to highlight the toll-like receptor today as well. Then to understand what the proteins uh, that BEF contains, uh, what they are doing, we predicted how these uh, proteins are, can interact with those proteins that are probably expressed and present in these cells. I say probably 
because it's important to, to understand that the source data from the host cell is transeptomic data, not proteomics data, unfortunately. So just based on the differential expression of the mRNA molecules, we predict that they will be translated. It's not always the case, so it's all important to keep that in mind. And then basically we are combining the two information, uh, the information that BEF proteins can connect potentially to, to host proteins and which host proteins are present in, in this particular cell type in that pathway. So to connect BEF proteins and, and host proteins, we have an in silico protein-protein interaction prediction pipeline, which works like that, that, that we take the, the information, the uh, sequence or, or if possible structural information of these proteins. We are looking the domains in this example, we are looking the different protein domains in the microbial proteins, and we are looking the different amino acid sequences motifs uh, on human proteins. These motifs are short sequences in a protein and could be really relevant for target sites of these domains um, that are present in host proteins, but also analogous domains can be found in microbial proteins. And we are using ELM and Interproscan as really nice established tools for such information. And when we combine them, we could potentially predict the microbial host interaction uh, if you identify a target site in a particular protein for a particular domain of a microbial protein. <clears throat> oh, okay, Thomas, get in again. Yeah, it looks like you drop out shortly. Uh, we still can't hear you, Thomas, because you're still muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. were okay. up to the in silico domain motif prediction slide. Okay, when you I'm sorry drop about out. that. That's all right. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, so, so basically, the, the, the point I made is that by combining information from ELM and Interproscan, uh, we are able to predict a connection between a microbial protein containing a specific domain and, and a human protein containing a target sequence uh, motif uh, on them. So using, using that uh, workflow, we, we investigated BEF proteins and, and TOLAC receptor signaling and going to focus a specific set of our results uh, on this talk due to uh, the time. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm going to focus more on the TOLAC receptor pathway, which is, as you know, it's a really important innate immune uh, pathway relevant in epithelial and immune cells uh, and for inflammatory and anti-inflammatory uh, regulation. And it's important to, to know that, that while I'm gonna mention uh, TOLAC receptor four signaling, which can recognize LPS and it's quite relevant uh, for different bacterial uh, pattern recognitions, including in some cases, uh, BT related LPS or its modified uh, derivatives. Um, in most of the, the, the results, I'm going to focus uh, on, on, on intracellular protein-protein interactions. Um, and we have some experimental um, studies already finished or still ongoing that are distinguishing between, between the uh, interactions of the LPS and that's activation of, of, on the TLR uh, pathway. Um, but, but, but in the next couple of slides, I'm, I'm going to focus more on, on what is happening uh, on the intercellular level. So uh, for the TOLAC receptor pathway, we created a, a network view based on a priori knowledge. So this is what we know in a way, it's much what looks much worse than a textbook uh, figure that you have seen on the, on the previous slide, but, but this is more closer to, to reality, just to clarify. Um, and we put the receptors on the top and the transcription factors on the bottom and different uh, layers of uh, regulation of the pathway uh, in between. And, and this is just how it looks uh, in, 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 as an aggregated form, let's put it that way. If we add the cell type specific expression data, we can add really nice colors. 
to the uh, to this pathway. So one of the things that you need to constantly look at is basically this scale from this bluish to the yellow, yellow blue scale, which shows that the more yellow that that gene is expressed more in healthy condition uh, and more blue is, is expressed in UC conditions. And there are some, some extreme cases, orange only expressed in healthy conditions. Those genes are not expressed uh, in UC condition and the purple is the, is the other way around specifically expressed in UC condition, not expressed um, in a healthy condition. And you can see some gray ones, which are also really important. Those genes are not expressed in the given cell type in the given condition. So this is how the toll-like receptor uh, look like uh, in one type of dendritic cells I'm going to, to, to mention to you. And it already shows uh, a really nice heterogeneity uh, that, that from the all potential things that I mentioned that can, that can happen in a toll uh, right receptor pathway. Um, some of them are, uh, it, well, it's basically really active, obviously, this pathway in dendritic cells, not surprisingly. Uh, but there are very specific uh, condition specific differences there. And the other thing I want to highlight is those genes, sorry, those proteins from now on, those proteins that have a, a black thick edge you might see them. These are all the proteins that we predicted uh, to be targeted by proteins coming from a BT um, BAV. So um, that's already quite interesting. And that's one of the reasons why we selected the TOLRAC receptor pathway, because we found a big enrichment of targets uh, in this pathway comparing to other signaling pathways, just to clarify. So, so if I would look at another signaling pathway, like. VNT, for example, uh, or Notch, I wouldn't see that many uh, targets. But, but somehow we see that the TOLAC receptor pathway contains many uh, proteins which are somehow targeted by, by uh, BEF proteins. And in this particular case, I'm, I'm showing you uh, the DC1 population, a dendritic cell population that is more related to healthy condition. And, and in this one, TOLAC receptor 4 is actually not even uh, expressed but other, other receptors are expressed. Um, and, and you see lots of orange proteins. I would like to, 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 to highlight these, which means that, that this is mostly the way how this pathway is, is actually functioning uh, in this condition. And, and in, sorry, in, in this cell type. If we look at the DC2s, which are more the inflamed condition related dendritic cells, we see a very different pattern. Um, we see that, that, that most of the proteins are, are present even in a healthy condition, which makes sense because that, that's the role of these the, uh, dendritic cells to, to be more reactive. Um, and also I would like to highlight these, these three purple guys. Uh, so three proteins that are only expressed in, in, in UC conditions. So, so that, that means that when there's a disease, there could be a major disruption uh, in how DC2s are, are working. And, and many of the interacting proteins of these uh, are targeted by BEVs, which could actually mean uh, or potentially explain why they could be beneficial. Um, because, because if this guy is not working properly and its interactors are being targeted, it could actually balance and compensate for the loss of, uh, of, of, of the signaling activity there. So I would like to focus now on two, two parts of this network, because obviously it's really big, probably you can't even read it uh, on this slide. Uh, but in a way, I just wanted to give you a, 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 a global picture of this pathway. But I would like to now focus on the TLR4 pathway and its adapter TRAP. So first, let's start with the TLR4. So it's obviously a big, big protein, uh, a transmembrane uh, protein, which is a cytoplasmic uh, domain called the tear domain. And on that domain, there's a binding motif uh, that, that a specific protein um, often found in, in these BAVs uh, can, can, can bind to. And it's really interesting that it's a PDZ domain on this, this uh, carboxy. Uh, on this uh, protease, carboxy terminal protease, which means that it's probably important for, for, for uh, making the protease activity of this BAF protein specific 
to be closer to TLR4 receptors. And that's really important for us to understand the specificity of, of this enzymatic activity that, that these BEF proteins can do. The other example is related to TRAP, which is an adapter protein of, of TLR4. And uh, it's really important for the mid-88 uh, dependent pathway coming downstream from, from TLR4 ending similarly on the NF-kappa B pathway, uh, like the others. And it's important for, for inflammation regulation. And here for TRAP, we found a couple of interesting things. It's so, some of these are, are still ongoing. And, and actually, this, this part, especially the experiments, are happening in monocytes. Uh, while I was talking mostly on dendritic cells, so I don't want to confuse you. Uh, but still, it's really interesting. So I wanted to, to highlight that. So I mentioned the interactions between TLR4 and, and the BEF protein, this protease. But we also found that, that there are, as I mentioned, many other interactions in the downstream part of the pathway, but also in, in particular in TRAP. So that's directly interacting with TLR4. And there are multiple BEF proteins with multiple different uh, enzymatic activities that target TRAP. So TRAP looks, TRAP looks like a hotspot for, for these BEF proteins. And we, we are now trying to understand why, why is that. And uh, the fact that there are multiple binding sites on TRAP shows that there is less chance uh, for some kind of artificial um, hub-like um, um, enrichment. And then there might be real biology behind that. We don't know yet the details, I have to say. Um, but it's already quite quite interesting to, to say that the TRAP is targeted by my multiple uh, BEF proteins from BT. So when we, um, in an experiment, when we inhibited TRAP, um, we found that there's a 45% activation decrease of the NF-kappa B uh, gene activity, which means that, that indeed the TRAP, um, TRAP adapter is quite important but still uh, other proteins uh, coming from BEVs uh, can still modulate the pathway, which, which is probably very relevant uh, in, in, in normal situation and probably in UC as well. What was really interesting that, that without BEV, but if we would just look at uh, E. coli LPS that activates the TLR4, um, the inhibitor resulted in an 85% activation decrease uh, showing that indeed these molecules targeting downstream parts of the TLR pathway could be really very relevant to, to modulate that. So, so we see some kind of upstream targeting in these monocytes uh, of the pathway, but also with the in vitro analysis, we pointed out that the downstream targeting of the pathway could also be relevant. And then the last result slide and last network slide, um, I just wanted to, to highlight really the cell type and condition specific uh, activity and then things that we see with the toll like receptor pathway. Uh, we're going back to dendritic cells here. So this is a subnetwork of the previous big one where we are focusing specifically on TRAP. So this adapter protein that you have seen in the previous slide. And we look at its neighbors. So proteins that are interacting with TRAP, activating it, it's an adapter protein. So there are multiple downstream proteins uh, connecting uh, to it. And in this uh, healthy related dendritic cell type, we see that, that basically TRAP is really functioning in a healthy situation. So you see TRAP itself is orange and then many of its uh, activating receptors are both TLR1 and 2. Uh, are health related, uh, so so uh, in the DC one. So so it's it's really important to see that 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 TRAP and its function in DC one cells are really working irrelevant in health, health situations. While we compare it to DC two uh, cells, we see that 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 that's basically a, a pathway which is working in both cases. It doesn't matter whether it's a healthy or a UC condition, the the pathway pathway will work. And as you can see with the highlights, there are multiple uh, BT uh, BEF target proteins, even already in that, that subnetwork. And what is really important to highlight, this is just, just bringing up the previous big network I, I showed to you, is that while, so what you see on the right is, is, is here, 
So what is really important to see that while these are green and then there are some BEF targets, we have these, these uh, purple, um, purple proteins that are downstream uh, of these and and they could be they they could actually uh, do something differently in UC. So while the actual expression network does not show uh, any major things, if we look one stream uh, one step sorry one step downstream from from these proteins, we see something different. Uh, there are new proteins there, and because of that, we feel that that the fact that that four out of the five downstream uh, proteins from TRAP can potentially be targeted by, by BT BAVs, um, so as TRAP shows that that could be an important role in, in compensating for the appearance of that three UC specific proteins. And with this, I would like to, to, to summarize the, um, the talk. So uh, as I mentioned, we developed this in silico pipeline uh, to, to, to predict cell type and condition specific effects of BAV proteins. Uh, we focused on, on BT and, and IBD, but the whole pipeline was developed in a way that, that it doesn't matter which, which microbial or even host protein you are using for, for this. Uh, so it can be used for, for, for host uh, extracellular vesicular studies as well. Um, and, and hopefully all the documents that we are providing will help you to, to, to use this pipeline. And we highlighted some regulatory hotspots uh, around TRAP, for example, in monocytes and dendritic cell types that that particularly interesting. And we are uh, we, there are still some ongoing experiments to characterize this better. And um, and and I, I highlighted the specific cell type and condition specific difference between BT and TLR pathway interactions which could be really interesting to understand what these uh, bacterial proteins that we potentially would like to use in microbial therapies can do in a healthy situation and can do in a disease situation. So just going back to the IBD slide I mentioned earlier, uh, it really matters when we are giving a microbial therapy for a patient. Some microbial therapies could be really useful for a patient in remission, but probably ineffective if we give it too early when they are in an inflamed situation. Why some microbial therapies could be really efficient to decrease the inflamed situation, but they might not be as useful to keep the patient in remission. And, and this is a really key question to define future microbial therapies in IBD and such cell type specific and condition specific analysis can, can bring us uh, closer to that, uh, we hope. Um, obviously, there, there should be further work needed to characterize the effect, for example, of these interactions. I, I mentioned lots of uh, BT BEF protein interacting with TLR pathway proteins. Uh, we, are, we need to characterize, we are working on some of them, but we need to characterize better uh, the effect of that. Is it an activatory or an inhibitory interaction, for example, and how it is actually changing uh, downstream effects? And the final take home message is basically that, that I, I, I think for any future experimental design, it's really important to take into account different cell types. Even if you can't do single cell analysis, uh, often in our lab, we are doing um, sorted um, cells. Uh, so just to make it more specific than just uh, bulk uh, RNA uh, analysis, it's really important um, to, to, to distinguish between cell types. And I already highlighted the potential for that in probiotic supplementation. Okay, uh, and uh, if you're interested about uh, more details, we have a, we have a preprint uh, already available in BioArchive. We are currently working on the revision of that. We received really good uh, and very, very constructive feedbacks from, from the reviewers and the editors. So, so there will be a, hopefully a, a, a new version for that. But until then, if you would like to see the figures and then the current state of the manuscript, you can see it in the preprint. And if you are interested about the pipeline itself, this is this is a link uh, where, where, where it can be accessed and then everything is open access there. And, and with that, I would like to thank my group uh, for their great work, especially Leila, uh, who is a, a finally a PhD student in, in my group and, and, and did most of the computational work. And we did this whole work with, with the carding uh, group in the Quadram Institute. Uh, they are a really, really great uh, group working with BT for, for, for many years now. 
and then they are doing the experimental part uh, of the project. And as I mentioned, if you are interested about any any uh, pipelines or tools that that were mentioned, this this is a website where you can access that. And if you have any questions, this is my email address, and I'm really happy to to address any any questions or direct you to the relevant person or tool. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Great presentations and wonderful tools um, available for us to try that. As a non-bioinformatician, I guess uh, my question will be, uh, do you have suggestion how to start setting up uh, the experiment? So how, how many data do we need and how, how can we prepare ourselves best to actually uh, get the sort of like in, uh, informative result from using these tools that you're developing? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So what's the minimal set basically that, that you can use, right? Mm. Yeah, so, so I think um, it's, it's not the easy, by the way, it's not an easy question. Uh, so um, I think it's really relevant that, that first you understand your biological system and and then then if you, and and have a very specific question. So so in most of the cases, the issue is coming from the fact that that people are uh, just generating big data and different omics data sets, and they would like to do something with that. And it's much easier and then more efficient if you already have a, a hypothesis, uh, and and the and then you generate data related to that hypothesis. So in our case, basically, we wanted to understand. Uh, the connection between BEF proteins and and the, the uh, host, and and for that we we, we used uh, this proteomics data set from one side and transcriptomic data set from the other side. So uh, there are many other data sets that can fine tune this better. I mentioned that there might be still some false positives uh, in this this analysis or not enough details on what is happening, and and I think adding more. Uh, information can help to create better results. But I think for, for a as a minimal set, um, I think just having one type of reliable information from one of the elements in your system uh, is a good start. It's actually, I, I think it's, a, it's an in important ongoing issue in the field that how you can do, um, how, you, how you can, uh, integrate the variation into these computational models. Because basically in an experimental design, you need the different replicates because there is obviously biology. There, there's a, a variation there. And, and especially for, to be honest, for single cell data, that's a key issue. So, so it really matters even how the single cell data was, was done, what depth sequencing depths was used, for example, for that. Uh, we, we felt in many studies that we, we analyzed that, that in many cases, um, you're just missing the variation just because of how, how the experiment was done. And then that means that you can create either artificial results or you are missing the signals. In many cases, that's, that's the case actually, which is really sad because the experiments are really expensive already. So, so it, it would be nice if, if there would be better, better readouts for that. So, so I don't think that there's a, a particular uh, solution for that uh, in terms of, yeah, just do what you can, but obviously there will be a financial cap for, 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 for that. Um, but what we can do, and, and in some cases could be really useful for any experimental uh, analysis, is to, to combine uh, existing other data sets. So there's, there's, the, there's a, um, a real advantage on multi-center uh, analysis when, when multiple types of experiments were done in different places, in different labs, uh, some have already been published might be, and, and combining them. And then it's not an easy thing to combine, but if you are able to, to do that, that, that could help. Just to give an example, in this uh, single set data set we used, there were 51 different cell types, and we identified 10 out of the 51 that was the same as in another study. So we then we had two studies in two different labs uh, focusing on that 10 cell types. And when we did that analysis, we had much better and, and, and then probably more reliable 
results, but it was only 10 out of the 51. So you are losing and gaining always. Mm. Uh, yeah, it is, it is uh, really hard to sort of um, try to set up uh, the experiment well. I think that's what we need to do and um, the, have the real conversation between us and the, the one who's actually doing the data analysis and developing the pipeline like yourself. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to add that, that I think it's really important to, to have these discuss discussions as early as possible. So, so even for the experimental design, uh, that, that could be really important. And I hope these pipelines and tools that I, I, I presented uh, could, could really um, inspire uh, you to, 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 to think about these type of integrative approaches because they could be really cool. Yeah, certainly. So I've got a question here from Rafi. Are you going to unmute or shall I just uh, read it? Uh, I guess uh, I'll just read it. It were these studies done from human IBD samples? So I guess it's, uh, is it clinical samples um, that you're using? Yes. So in this particular study, uh, what they did was, was basically they had, I think, 18 uh, IBD patients. And, and they, they actually took samples, biopsy samples from, from the inflamed side of the gut. That's the sample type we used in this particular study. But they also did... Um, sampling from a non-inflamed site of the same patient. And again, we just talk about variation. That was really cool for us because then it meant that, that from the same genotype, uh, same patient, we had non-inflamed and inflamed uh, data. But for this analysis that, that I showed, it was from healthy controls and then the IBD patients, yes. So um, maybe I was missing this information, but uh, with the single cell sequencing, um, so then, um, how many sort of person, how many percentage of data is actually um, we can see as uh, extracellular vesicles? Can we actually tease that out? Ah, that that's a really good question. So so yes, there there's an opportunity now and then adapters for 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 when you are uh, preparing your samples to to filter for for extracellular vesicles. So, so actually you can do that. And, and in a way, what uh, is interesting is not even the single cell sequencing, but, but the proteomics analysis or metabolomics analysis. Uh, although there are some, some, some um, uh, RNA molecules in these BAVs, but, uh, but, but, but the point is that if you can uh, look for them, sort, so, sort for these BAVs, uh, then actually it's really interesting to do some omics analysis in those. Okay, uh, all right. Is there any more questions? No? Um, Yumi? Okay. Uh, have you ever assessed the effects of bacterial EV on other type of TLR expressing immune cells, especially those related to immune suppressive effects of B EV? Yeah, so, so, so that part is, is a good, really good question. So, so far we just looked at macrophages, um, um, different types of macrophages and monocytes other than dendritic cells. Um, but that, that's something that, that, that we are currently discussing what, what, what immune cell populations we should really focus on. Because the, 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 as, as I mentioned, the main message of the, the talk was that, that all the cell types and conditions are really different which means that if you would like to do a focused analysis, you can't, can't analyze everything. So, so yeah, I, I, I agree that, that, that it would be really important to, to, to look at that. For me, the immunosuppressive effects, I'm, I'm particularly interested about, about dendritic cells, to be honest. I, I think that they could be really important and it has been shown before that they are really important in IBD, uh, but there could be other cell types. So I'm not ruling that out, obviously. And last questions again from Rafi. Uh, how did you make sure that EV is only from BT, not from other bacteria? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I didn't mention the experimental design behind that. So um, the uh, source uh, for, for uh, the, the BT proteins were coming from a, a germ-free mice, uh, which was monocolonized uh, with BT. So in theory and in practice, there shouldn't be any other uh, bacteria there. 
Okay. That's great. Uh, I think with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the session.